about The Midnight Witch and give you a chance to get for yourself some deleted scenes. So I will read a little bit from those scenes and if you stick around I'll tell you near the end of the video how you can get these extra 20 pages to download for yourself. <laughs> Midnight Witch is set in 1913 in London, um, very much Downton Abbey era. The story tells of Lady Lilith Montgomery, who is an aristocratic young lady living in a very affluent part of London, and she falls in love with Bram, who is an impoverished artist in the Bohemian Quarter. So in the scenes I'm going to talk to you about, the First World War has started and Bram has been sent off to fight. He's gone to Africa, uh, not many people know that we did fight a part of the First World War in Africa, and he ends up in a particularly nasty part of it. Um, meanwhile, Lilith uh, is left at home to cope with London and wartime, and in the scenes that I've, I'm going to tell you about, she goes to visit Mangan in prison. <coughs> if you've read the book, <laughs> those names and places will mean something to you. If you haven't, don't worry. This is just gonna give you a flavor of, of what they get up to. Later on in the video, I'm going to tell you how to access these deleted scenes and download them for yourself. So let's have a look. So I'm going to read you a little bit now. Hope you're sitting comfortably. The Midnight Witch deleted scenes. It is not yet noon, but the heat of the African sun has already rendered the unacclimatized British troops lethargic and bad tempered. Brown sits amidst a crowd of khaki his pack beside him on the dusty track, resigned to the lack of shade or respite from the high temperature. His battalion disembarked from their ship less than two weeks ago, and yet somehow it seems as if life before wartime Africa, life before heavy boots and putties, before lump and kit bags and stony ground for a bed, and all the myriad challenges his new environment contains, such life never existed. His world is shrunk to the next march, the next camp, the next meal, the next assault, the next ambush, the next blessed drink of water. There is no past, there may very well be no future. All he can concern himself with is the here and now. And here is an arduous, unforgiving place, and now is a dangerous, deadly time. Right you are, gentlemen, Second Lieutenant Bryant barks at the men, knowing they will not be quickly roused from their torpor. Let's have you on your feet, shall we? Look lively now, or I'll leave your sorry carcasses for the hyenas. He strides down the shambolic line, assisting the troops to their feet, with further cajoling, reinforced by the occasional prod from his ever-present cane. The men haul themselves upright and shoulder their packs. Bram is pleased to be on the move once more. It is the sitting around, the waiting that he finds most difficult. The march camp, march camp routine is a dull slog the tedium of which is relieved only by the terror of being caught in an ambush, or very occasionally being required to mount an attack. But at least when they're travelling, putting one blistered booted foot in front of the other, covering the endless dusty miles, at least the rhythm of action and the attention such exertion requires occupies him. For it is in the empty times that his mind wanders to painful places he would rather not visit, places inhabited by Lilith, or more precisely, the loss of Lilith. On good days, he can enjoy recalling her and find comfort in picturing her in his mind's eye, her beautiful face, her rare but heartwarming smile, her deep, watchful gaze. It is a pleasure, then, to be lost in the memory of her. But other times, most times, what strikes him first is the blow of having given her up, the agony of having had her turn away from him. Even after three long years, the wound is fresh and raw as it ever was. Colonel Johannes Plessy is a formidable South African with an abundant beard and blazing eyes, given to screaming obscenities at civilians and soldiers on both sides, lapsing into tirades of unfathomable Afrikaans and engaging in acts of bravery beyond anything that might be reasonably expected of even a commanding officer. He is, even as his dissenters must allow, an experienced soldier and leader of men. Most concede that he is their best hope of success, even if that only means staying alive. He does not have the men's love, 
but he does have their unswerving respect. They will follow him wherever he leads. They will do whatever he asks. They just won't ever like him for it. With further pushing from the lieutenant and not a little grunting and groaning from the men, the company is at last on the march. Bram takes his place somewhere in the front half of the line. He has not been selected for point or sweeper duty and the safest place to be is in the body of the group at near one end. They were warned on day one to be vigilant for signs of ambush, but the reality is that the alertness required to spot such clues is impossible to maintain over long hours of foot slogging. And besides, the enemy forces are expert at guerrilla warfare and are not in the business of giving themselves away. The first Bram knew that they were under attack on the first occasion his battalion marched into an ambush was when a bullet removed his helmet from his head. Had he been wearing the cap of an officer, he would have been dead. Indeed, had he been an inch taller, the bullet would have travelled through his skull as well as the tin of the helmet. The men either side of him had died without ever knowing about it. Then the initial rifle fire had been replaced by the relentless spewing of a machine gun and the company had fled to whatever cover existed. A third of those soldiers Bram had left Portsmouth docks with only weeks earlier died in that ambush. For the rest, the attack may well be the reason they live long enough to return home, showing them as it had what lay in wait for them in the long grasses of the savannah and how best they might avoid it. Bram notices the army chaplain, Father Michael, a little way ahead and quickens his pace to fall into step beside him. It is not his faith that draws him to the man, but a shared love of art. Their conversations on the subject have, Bram is convinced of it, saved his sanity on more than one occasion. Ah, Lance Corporal Cardale, striding out in good order this morning, I'm happy to see. Thanks to your talents for obtaining sticking plasters, Father. Think nothing of it. After all, am I not bound to assist, but the soul is in torment. He allows himself a little girlish giggle as his own joke, even though he must have used it many times before. In any case, he goes on, can't have the only person around here who knows his Monet from his Manet being hospitalised now, can I? Bram gives a rueful smile. You don't see our noble commanding officer as a lover of the Impressionists, though. I think if you furnish the redoubtable Colonel Plessy with a paintbrush, he would more than likely kill somebody with it, noisily. Hasn't been asking you for plasters, I don't suppose, said Bram. <laughs> what blister would dare go near one of his feet? No, the good Colonel has many fine qualities, most of which we must all be grateful for, but sensitivity of any kind is not listed among them. They march on in companionable silence for some time. It has been three days since they have encountered the enemy, so that the twang of tension which ordinarily runs through the line has slackened a fraction. Bram finds himself focusing on the distant horizon, enjoying for the moment the fact that it is distant. They have previously spent days pushing through the hellish elephant grass that covers the plains in the summer months. It stands higher than a man's eye line, so that even he knows, that, though he knows that they are in open country, stretching great distances in all directions, Bram feels the choking panic of claustrophobia rising within him. He has had cause to wonder if a person could drown in this sea of grass. All that is visible is the back of the man in front and a stretch of featureless sky. The air is dirt dry and buzzing with biting flies, and what flies they are in this land of extremes. Flies and other bugs of such tenacity, such apparent mania to devour, to sting, to bite, to breed, to inhabit, to infest, to conquer being so many hundreds of times their own size. That a man can be felled by a bullet fired into his body at speed makes sense just about. That a strong, healthy human can be brought to his knees by nothing more than a small swarm of innocuous looking flies. Or if... So in this scene, um, Lilith goes to visit uh, Mangan, who is um, an artist who was, was Bram's mentor and tutor, and she goes to visit him because he's been um, put in prison for being a conscientious ob objector and refusing to fight in the war because of his beliefs, and she goes to visit him. He's not a young man and she's worried about him. With packing underway, I set about fulfilling my promise to help Mangan. A series of phone calls, more than one of which was to a fellow coven member, quickly result in my being given permission to visit, so that by noon I find myself sitting in a tiny dark room in Wormwood Scrubs. I had brought some biscuits and ham and brandy with me, but all were taken away when I entered, and I fear none will reach their destination. When the prison guard leaves me alone, closing the heavy iron door behind him, 
I have to master the panic that rises within me like bile. The walls of the room are rough stone, misery grey, and emanate both cold and a tangible sadness, as if the despair of those who have passed through this horrid space resides within them still. And there is an odour, a smell of dampness and poor food and stale sweat and fear. The heavy bars on the small, high window block out what little daylight tries to penetrate this awful place. I try not to think about how damaging to the soul it must be to be incarcerated here. Footsteps herald the return of the guard. He opens the door and stands back. Mangan appears in the doorway, hesitant, peering into the dimness of the room. He's a large man whose personality usually makes him appear larger still, but now his posture is timid stooped, diminished, how terribly his confinement has affected him, even in this short time. I leap to my feet and go to him. Mangan, my dear Mangan. I reach out my arms, but a stern look from the jailer reminds me that physical contact of any kind is forbidden. Lilith, Mangan steps a little closer. Can it really be you? A faltering smile lights up his face. Let's sit down, I suggest, horribly aware of how frail he is. My eyes are brimming with tears, but I blink them away, determined not to add to his troubles with my own. We take our seats either side of the narrow table. Mangan begins to brighten a little, leaning forwards, his eyes shining as he looks at me. How wonderful of you to visit me. How kind. I should have come sooner had I known. I went to see Jane. Poor Janie. Is she coping? No, that question requires no answer for I know Jane will always cope. She is terribly worried about you. She has asked me to try to help. She should not have. No point in laying our troubles at your door. I know I have stayed away since, but, but Mangan, I hope you still count me your friend. I hope you will let me help you. My darling girl, there is nothing to be done. My conscience has brought me here and will keep me company until the end of the conflict in which this world is embroiled. There it is. Do not ask me to compromise my principles, Lilith, please. You must know I will not. I cannot. I wouldn't dream of trying, I tell him. I wouldn't waste my breath. We both smile a little at this. I admire your courage, you must know that, but your health is suffering here, and while it seems there is no end in sight to this terrible war, I wanted you to know that I will do what I can, for your sake and for Jane's. It may be possible to have you moved. A prison is a prison. I cannot secure your freedom, that's true, but, but some who object, who refuse to fight as a matter of conscience, they're sent out to the country. There are places so much better for you than here. You would be outside, able to breathe the air and feel the sunshine. You would be given work to do on the land. You might even be permitted to paint. Mangan gave a bark of laughter. And what promises and compromises would you have to make to send me to such a rural idyll? I will not have you selling your soul to save mine, I will not. I do have friends who may help you, you know that. Ah oh, yes, our brethren, he steals a glance at the door, knowing the jailer will be listening to our conversation. Tread carefully, darling girl. Your position may give you influence, but you must not undermine that position at any cost. Do not concern yourself about me. I will be cautious, but I will do my very best for you. He nods, smiling, and pats the pockets of his drab uniform, forgetting for a moment that he has permitted neither pipe nor tobacco. He takes a breath, and I see something of the old familiar Mangan, the fetid sculptor, the man of principle. I see something of him return to the bony form in front of me. At last he says, then I am in the best of hands. Now tell me of the world. Tell me of how those society artists fare without me to stir them up and shake up their stuffy notions of what they call art. So meanwhile, back in Africa, poor old Bram is continuing with his, his dreadful posting. Bram stands for a moment and tries to make sense of the river itself. It is a fat, grey slug of a thing slipping silently by. There are no rocks or rapids, just a thickness of water, devoid of any of the customary charm of a river. It is opaque. It does not sparkle. It does not appear to support life, although he knows it must. It seems to him a terrible thing, full only of different ways of dying, with the promise of the surprise of that death, 
which might sneak up upon you in the night on whining wings or leap from the depths with fetid jaws again. He wants to draw it. He wishes more than anything right now that he had paints to capture the brooding muddy colours. But he knows in any case he will not forget them. He will be able to reproduce them one day, a long time from now, so long as he first gets down the likeness of the river on paper, its scale, its noiseless power, its horror, somehow its stink. His fingers itch to get a charcoal and sketchbook and capture the malevolence of the thing, but Second Lieutenant Bryant has other ideas. Answer Corporal, when you've finished admiring the view, would you be so kind as to set up the maxim? Pointing down river, if you please. Don't want to be caught with our trousers down now, do we? He turns to go and then adds, up here, Corporal, nice and safe on the grassy bank. You might fancy a little sunbathing on the beach down there, but I would rather not have to explain to the CO why he is short one expensive piece of artillery when the croc that eats you uses it to pick his teeth. Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. The officer throws him a despairing glance and moves away. By the time he has carried out the lieutenant's orders, darkness has fallen. Bram is still often caught out by the fleeting nature of an African twilight. One minute the sky is cerulean, the next crimson and scarlet in sunset, the next ink blue black. He pulls a small sketch pad from his pack and stares into the gloom. He knows the river is there, he can smell it. He can feel the thick wetness of it and the cooling the air above it, but he cannot see it. There is little moon to speak of, and the gathering clouds block what light it might have thrown down. Gaps between them show fierce stars, stars that can surely not be the same ones as hover gently over England now. One of Thomas Hardy's poems comes to him where he speaks of strange-eyed constellations. He remembers now that it was written about Africa, about a fallen soldier buried on the plains in the Boer War. Closing his eyes for a moment, he whispers the last verse to himself. Yet portion of that unknown plain will hodge for ever be. His homely northern breast and brain grow to some southern tree, and strange-eyed constellations reign his stars eternally. Bram recalls listening to Lilith read the poem, and the memory clutches at his heart. He pushes it away and pushes himself back to his sketchbook. So, I hope you'll forgive my stutterings and stumblings. Those are just a few pages taken from the 8,000 words or so that make up the deleted scenes because when you write a book you often write longer drafts and then you are compelled to trim them and cut them and sometimes those cut bits are quite good and a bit of a shame to have them go to waste. So if you would like to download them and have them for yourself and hear the rest of them, read the whole piece rather than my little extracts, um, go to my website and go to the books page and you will find instructions there on how to download the pages, okay? Um, I'll put instructions at the bottom of this um, video down here in the comments. So uh, let me know how you get on, let me know that you managed to find them. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already and happy reading. <laughs>